are fearful. See what is the condition. And many people don't understand that this is nothing but epilepsy. So to increase the awareness, this today's program will help you to understand it better. The scheme of my presentation will be definition, classification, investigations, and epilepsy types. Then subsequent speakers will tell you in detail about the uh, epilepsy in each age group. So define a seizure. It is a transient occurrence of a signs or symptoms due to abnormal excessive neuronal discharge in the brain. When somebody has two or more unprovoked seizures, that means without any provoking stimulus like fever or hyponatremia or trauma, somebody has two or more seizures 24 hours apart, then we will call it as epilepsy unless proven otherwise. So they should be unprovoked. And these are group of disorders with variable etiologies and prognosis. Why we want to know much about epilepsy and why this, all these talks are there because the lifetime incidence of seizure is 5 to 10 percent and the uh, incidence in, uh, is around 24 to 53 per 100,000 person years. It is highest in the younger age group, especially in, in neonates and infants and then the older age group. The prevalence is lowest in infants and children and it increases in early adulthood, midlife and decreases later in the life. Nearly one in 100 suffers from epilepsy. So why, what are the difficulties in diagnosis of epilepsy? Because as we know, epilepsy is a clinical diagnosis and it depends on the eyewitness, which most of the times are not available or unreliable. Then the phenomenon of epilepsy is episodic. There are no physical signs so we can't uh, definitely say this is epilepsy or not. When we come to the investigations, we have EEG, the findings which are variable. Normal EEG does not rule out epilepsy. And when we go for MRI, it can be normal or it can be abnormal, but every time abnormality does not support the diagnosis of epilepsy because it can be incidental. So, Reliable history and witnessed uh, evidence is valuable than abnormal investigations. So what history you will ask to the patient, what he was doing at the time? Did he get any warning signs? Did he black out? What happened afterwards? Was he taking any medications and has it been changed? And was there any witness? When you ask the witness, you have to ask what the patient was doing at that time. Did they notice, he notice any change or complaint before the event happened? Did they lose consciousness, have altered responsiveness or seem unaware of your presence? Were they still or did they jerk, twitch or move? What happened after the event and did anyone try to take the pulse? Each and every question is important because misdiagnosis is more common in epilepsy, nearly 23 to 26% of patients. And it is because of incomplete history taking. And whenever somebody has a doubt of epilepsy or seizure, they ask for EEG. And again, because of misinterpretation of EEGs, 30% of patients are diagnosed as epilepsy, although they did not have epilepsy. So what are the consequences of misdiagnosis of epilepsy, like unnecessary anti-seizure drug exposure? Then there is a social stigma associated with epilepsy. Nobody wants to tell that he is having epilepsy. So there are social relationships strainings. Then if it is a woman with childbearing age group, she will have, if pregnant, baby may develop teratogenicity. Unemployment is a major issue because nobody wants to employ, employ a person who is having epilepsy. Again, there are restrictions in education, driving and other fields and hampering the personal growth and development. So making the correct diagnosis is important. So we have to ask a question, is it a seizure? Is it epilepsy? What is the type of seizure or epilepsy? What is the cause of epilepsy? And last but not least, 
is what epilepsy syndrome it is. So evaluation of patient with epilepsy requires clinical history, history again, and retake the history. Then you may ask for scalp EEG if required neuroimaging and if it is refractory or you want to syndromic diagnosis, then video EEG. Before we start, we should know the function and its warning signs, what we call as aura from each lobe. Whenever a seizure arises from a temporal lobe, patient can have an aura of fear or they can have uh, uh, experiential auras like jamiswu, deja vu, or they can have a small, uh, strong order. If it comes from the occipital lobe, they can have visual uh, disturbances. They can see the colored images. They can see pictures or there will be the blackening in front of the eyes. When it comes from the postcentral gyrus, there will be a tingling or somatosensory phenomenon. When it comes from the frontal, it may be associated with focal motor, like there may be the jerking of the hand or there may be the facial grimacing and there may be other autonomic symptoms, especially sweating, flushing, pallor and epigastric sensations, which can be present. So to moving forward, now this is ILA 27 classification, which has removed the previous old terminologies like partial seizures, general focal uh, partial seizures, simple partial, complex partial, and that has been uh, removed, changed to the focal onset. So it can be focal aware seizure that is a previously simple partial or focal complex partial that is with impaired awareness. Then they have a motor, every focal onset seizure can have a motor onset, like there may be automatism, which I will show you. Then they can have atonic or clonic movements. There can be hyperkinetic seizures or myoclonic seizures. If it is only non-motor onset, like there can only be behavioral arrest, cognitive seizures, then there are some emotional changes and sensory symptoms. When it comes to generalized onset, again, they can be a motor or non-motor. Non-motor, what we call typically as absence, they are typical absence, atypical absence, myoclonic, and then eyelid myoclonia. Some seizures, we don't know whether they started with the focal onset or generalized onset. They are known as unknown onset. And epileptic spasms can be focal onset, generalized onset, or unknown onset. And the secondary generalized seizure, the terminology has been removed now, and it has changed to focal to bilateral tonic clonic. So whenever a patient, you see a patient, first try to find out the seizure type, whether it is focal, generalized, or unknown. Then epilepsy type, whether it's focal, generalized, combined, or unknown. And finally, epilepsy syndrome. With this, we have to identify the etiology also, such as structural, genetic, infectious, metabolic, immune, or unknown. So moving forward to the etiology of epilepsies, it can be idiopathic or benign, what we call now as a genetic or presumed genetic basis. Then it becomes symptomatic. It is mesial temporal sclerosis, then developmental malformations like focal cortical dysplasia or MCDs, sequelae of neurological injuries like HIE, meningoencephalitis, trauma, then granulomas like TB and NCC, then tumors, AVM, and cavernomas. So which are the localization-related epilepsy syndromes? Again, then we can subclassify into idiopathic and symptomatic. Symptomatic, as per the lobe, we have temporal, frontal, parietal, and occipital lobe epilepsy. When it comes to idiopathic, most commonly we can see the Rolandic epilepsy, what we call as BACTS, then benign occipital epilepsy to occipital paralysis, that is BOE, and then primary reading epilepsy. When it comes to generalized epilepsy syndrome, the symptomatic ones are West syndrome, lenox gastro and epilepsy with myoclonic aesthetic seizures. And when it comes to idiopathic, which we commonly see are the benign familial neonatal convulsions, then myoclonic epilepsy in infancy, childhood or juvenile absence epilepsy, juvenile myoclonic epilepsy, and grand mal epilepsy on awakening. Why this classification and syndromic diagnosis is important? in the uh, identity because selecting the appropriate anti-seizure drugs, fi finding out etiology and inheritance, prognostication of epilepsy, and if the patient is medically refractory, that if somebody has more than two seizures for more than a per month for more than two years on two appropriate drugs, he should undergo pre-surgical evaluation. So moving forward, this girl was referred for 
scholastic backwardness and she gets stuck while uh, many times in a day like this so she just blinks and there is a stare or what you can say rs behavioral rs and then she recovers and she resumes her work so she was absent during this period in the what we call so this is typical of absence seizure and eeg shows typical Three year generalized spike discharges. This is more common in childhood age group. Then this boy again, if we see, he is doing hyperventilation. So this is the uh, common activating procedure which we use in the OPD to induce the seizure. And commonly we get absence seizures. So suddenly he stops. He start blinking again. There are jerks of his neck, and then there is a shoulder jerks, and then he falls down. So this is not a typical absence. So we have this absence with myoclonus. So this myoclonic absence. Moving forward from like absence to generalized epilepsy, this is a 23-year male who had seizures from 14 years of age, sudden onset of dropping of objects from the hand early in the morning, and then GTCS, mostly related to sleep deprivation and watching the television started on phenotype and had a worsening of the seizure. So if you look, he has this first jerk, then the second jerk, which is what is myoclonus, then there is vocalization, then there is a tonic posturing. So each seizure is a different. So patient can have myoclonus only, they can have tonic seizures, now there are clonic jerks, they can have clonic jerks only, and then can have tonic clonic. So this is a patient who is a classical example of myoclonic epilepsy with tonic clonic convulsion, and he is suffering from JME, which worsened with the precipitant factors. This EEG shows the correlate with the myoclonus and generalized onset. And as he was inappropriate drug, and he was, because of that, he was refractory. When it was changed to valproate, he improved. We learned detail about this when we, uh, you will hear the subsequent talks. This is another girl, six years, seizures since three years. She had aura of fear, with, followed by behavioral change, right hand movements, then chewing movements, and she speaks during a seizure. So most of the time, these were used to miss, and sometimes it, she used to get hit from the teacher because she's misbehaving in the class. She was on two drugs, and if you go for previous classification, she's suffering from complex partial seizures temporal, and if it is in, then what we call it as non-motor onset focal seizure with impaired awareness. So if you look at this girl, she was sitting very quiet, and most of her seizures were missed, why they are missed? Because she never had a GTCS, and we have a habit of calling each and every seizure as a GTCS. She was sitting quietly, fiddling with her left uh, great toe. Suddenly, she opens the eyes. There is a change in behavior. She makes fists of her hand. Her grandmother recognizes it, that the seizure has started. Now look carefully at her left hand, which goes in the dystonic posture. Look at her face. She's making chewing movements, what we call a chewing automatism. She had a left hand dystonia. She looks to the left. She's sh shifting her body, partially trying to converse. And now she's looking to left as if somebody standing there with her left hand having dystonia. Right hand is free, and now the dystonia resolves. She tries to answer and wipes her nose. So this is what we call as hypomotor seizure with focal onset. And if you look at the EEG, there was onset from the temporal lobe, right side. And MRI showed right mesial temporal sclerosis. PET showed temporal hypometabolism. So. She had mesial temporal sclerosis. She had drug refractory epilepsy, underwent surgery six years back. And this is her hippocampus, which has sclerosed, and she's drug free for four years. So she is very good case to know and understand about the temporal lobe epilepsy.
Now, if you look at this patient, what is happening? She's doing something, suddenly bangs the table, laughs, shifts in the bed, trying to jump out, covers her face and laughs. And then recovers. So she was referred as a psychotic or she has a non-epileptic events. So many times these patients are referred like this. Her EEG showed this generalized discharge and we did not see the good rhythm which we saw previously. Her MRI was reported normal, but careful showed there is a left cingulate dysplasia. So these are the hypermotor frontal lobe epilepsy. She had seizures both during awake and the sleep period. So this is not a psychogenic episode or non-epileptic event. It turned out to be focal cortical dysplasia and now she is seizure free for four years. If you compare that patient with this patient, here also there is a change in behavior, some movement of the hand, Her husband recognizes that she is had a seizure. Now look at her breathing pattern. There is a change in the breathing. She has some leg movement, turns to left side. Now the breathing respiratory rate has increased. Some vocalization. Now she has started shouting or what is it? More of a cry. A few cries. The right hand, now both hand posture. And some chronic like movements. So if we compare this with the previous, this was a longer event. Then eyes were closed. There were arrhythmic jerk or asynchronous. There was a, not much pelvic thrusting, but usually when it is non-epileptic event, we get pelvic thrusting. There are precipitating factors and emotional stresses, and they never occur in the deep sleep. So these are the features which differentiate from true seizures and non-epileptic events. If you see this boy, you see here his face, there are a lot of bumps. He has developmental delay and if somebody touches, he suddenly drops like this. So this is what we call as atonic seizures and he had a drop attacks. So this is again one of the important thing we should know. If we look at these two ladies, which are, which are in their 60s and 70s, the left hand goes like this and the face and this is another lady with similar feature. So if any elderly comes with this feature and uh, cognitive decline, we have to think of autoimmune epilepsy, which will be more covered in the uh, epilepsy in elderly. This is like LGI1 encephalitis. And moving to the last case, this gentleman who is like a 44 year, uh, businessman was referred for non-epileptic uh, non event or psychogenic events because he lost money in the business and now he has these bizarre episodes where suddenly he falls backward. If you see, he has become limp. Now his father presses the bell and he has become a limp. He's not responding. If you look, his eyes have gone to the left. Then he jerks and he recovers within the next 30 seconds. So whether this was epilepsy, another important use of EEG, you should concentrate or look at the ECG and each EEG should have ECG because if you see clearly, there is a progressive change in the heart rate and there is a complete asystole. 
So he had a complex conduction defect and required pacemaker. He did not have epilepsy. So he had a synco, which led to cardiac nearly arrest and then the hypoxic seizure. So these are the non-epileptic organic events like TIA, syncope, TGA, which can behave or mimic epilepsy in adults. And in children, these are the breath holding spells, GRD, tics, and stereotypies. So what is the role of EEG? Routine awake EEG with hyperventilation and photic stimulation is abnormal in 50% of adults. When you have a sleep, it becomes 70 to 80 percent. That's why this is the importance of awake and sleep EEG. And when you do serial EEGs, if you have four recordings, 92 percent will have abnormal EEG. Recording duration, usually people do eight minutes, 10 minutes, 50 minutes. Ideally, it should be 30 to 40 minutes. Longer, the better. What are the problems? Because it needs proper training for accurate interpretation. Normal EEG does not exclude diagnosis. IEDs can be seen in normal individuals up to 4% and EEG or reporting should be avoided as misinterpreted as epileptiform abnormalities. Moving towards the end, imaging, MRI plays important role in etiological diagnosis. In refractory epilepsy, MRI is key for prognosis and not every MRI brain is epilepsy MRI. We require a dedicated epilepsy protocol Man behind machine is important and MRI negative does not mean too negative. We have to look carefully in each MRI. We have to spend hours together where we require expertise and teamwork. teamwork. PET scan and SPECT is not required in each and every patient, but it has a significant role in refractory epilepsy at experience centers. So if you look at these images, once most of the time these are overlooked and said normal, but if you look here and here, there is very tiny focal cortical dysplasia. Then there is a hypothalamic hematoma, which can be easily missed with the non-experienced uh, radiologist, and then the, your patient will be labeled. If you look at this, this is a bottom of circus dysplasia. Then this single nodular uh, heterotopia, periventricular nodular heterotopia, is epileptogenic, and treating this can make patients seizure free. Another important is uh, this temporal encephalocele. Then we have this MRI pet fusion, tractography, and then the reconstruction. So the take home message, as Dr. Rathod also already said, diagnosis of epilepsy is essentially clinical, take history, retake history and history. Careful interpretation of EEG is required. Electroclinical correlation and syndromic diagnosis helps in deciding appropriate treatment strategies and prognostication. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Sudip, uh, for setting the ground and um, uh, describing the clinical approach to epilepsy and the wonderful videos, which were really illustrative of uh, uh, how do we approach patients with seizures and epilepsy. Uh, we go on to the next talk. We would be taking the questions and answers towards the end, and there would be a discussion towards the end. So please stay back. And uh, we go on to the next talk uh, by uh, none other than Professor Dr. Rajesh Udani, a great friend, and probably one of the most astute clinical pediatric neurologists at least as I have ever come across and perhaps uh, in the world. I, I, I have absolutely no doubt uh, uh, when I'm making that statement because I have seen and interacted with him uh, both as, as a clinician, as uh, professionally, as well as a friend. And, and uh, all these interactions have been really, really wonderful. So I think there can be no better than uh, Dr. Vijesh Udani to give an overview of uh, the pediatric epilepsy scene and uh, how do we approach patients, children with seizures and epilepsy. So over to you, Dr. Udani. Please. Thank you. Thank you, Agandeep. Uh, it was very kind of you to say such nice words about me. And th thank you, Dr. Nirmal and Dr. Tiwari for inviting me to this, uh, to this uh, very 
uh, good conference on uh, epilepsy for, I think, physicians and practitioners who don't deal specifically with neurology. I'm just going to share my screen now. I'm going to concentrate on how pediatric epilepsy, oh God. Can you share, can you see my screen? Yes, very well, very well, yes, yes. Okay. Uh, you probably need to, uh, yeah, fantastic. Okay, so I'm basically gonna just tell you how is it different from adults, the approach, and I'm not, I'm, I'm gonna just touch upon uh, you know, strategies which are basically used for in sur like surgery, etc., because that's really drug resistant epilepsy, and most of the epilepsy which we see in the clinic is not thankfully drug resistant. Very goodness. Huh. So, I, I, as, as uh, uh, Dr. Jatab has already told you, the Prevalence of epilepsy is not the highest in kids, but the incidence is, and there are two peaks. One is in the early uh, period, below the age of, say, three or four years, maybe a maximum in the first year. And later on, the prevalence, of course, is very high, the incidence is very high in the elderly. And I think the, the conference is basically going to show these two extremes, because that's where epilepsy really occurs. Now, first thing you approach is, are these really seizures? And there are lots of differences between kids and adults. And I'll just show you a few videos, you know, in detail. For example, this is a newborn who's having these kind of myoclonic movements only in sleep. And this is really benign neonatal sleep myoclonus. It doesn't occur when the child is awake. This is a baby who is having this shuddering. And, you know, he shudders. It looks like he's having an infantile spasm. But actually, it's not at all. It's just a habit, a stereotypy, which many babies and, uh, you know, over the first year of life have. And the third one is a little rarer syndrome. This is a startle disease and very often is mixed up with, with myoclonic epilepsy. And as you can see, she's tapping the nose and uh, it's not really uh, changing. And these are basically jerks, which are, um, which are the differential diagnosis of seizures. Dr. Jagtab has already spoken about breath holding spells. This baby is crying, suddenly becomes stiff, quiet. In fact, the voice disappears. The face remains as if contorted by crying, but there is no voice. I'm sorry I put the sound off. And then the patient has tonic and some clonic movements. And this, of course, has to be treated with iron and calcium and not epilepsy. So if some goes away, it's a type of syncope in children. And then you have this peculiar motor seizures, which are diagnosed as motor seizures. And actually, it's self-gratification behavior. You know, she's in her own world. She's rubbing her thighs together. She's getting pleasure. And she, this little baby basically looks like she's having a complex partial seizure or, a, you know, one of those peculiar behaviors. And then you have these drop attacks. And let's see the first drop attack. This is a non-epileptic attack. And one of the ways we try to find out is, I'm trying to put this on his head. And he's getting it. And there, he's, there he goes. So I just put a tuning fork. I make, you know, they're so naive and so innocent that they believe me when I say that baby is going to you know, have a seizure and the child is going to have a seizure and that's what he does. This confirms, you know, without doing expensive video ages, et cetera, that this is definitely a non-epileptic event. And this is, if I don't have a video of this, but this is the adolescent girl who had convulsive syncope. So syncope doesn't have to be only a simple faint. You may actually have motor movements, myoclonus, et cetera. This is, of course, a very famous video, which is shown in many conferences. Now, this is a nine-year-old boy, drug-resistant seizures when climbing. Most important is when he's climbing or playing football, and then you'd see his ECG. He's been having seizures, these so-called seizures for years, not controlled, and then there's prolonged QT interval syndrome, and obviously needs a, um, you know, a defibrillator in his brain, in his heart. So essentially, there are lots of, you know, conditions which look like seizures. Now, look at this one. This is a boy who gets up in the middle of the night, runs around. It is not stereotypic. He partly responds. He's crying. He 
goes to the bathroom, even mother tells him to go and pass urine, he does and he walks around. He looks terrified, agitated, you know, fearful. And this is actually a non-epileptic parasomnia, the so-called night terror, which occurs very often in school going children, he usually goes away by the time they have the lessons. And this is another girl. And if you look at her, she's rocking, she's staring, she's turning around. arranging these, you know. But this happens for a short time every night. And it's the same thing which happens. And she, in fact, has a focal hyperkinetic seizure. So, you know, in sleep, altered behavior can be seizures as well as parasomnias. And the longer they are, the less stereotypic they are, they're more likely to be parasomnias. And the more stereotypic and shorter they are, more likely to be seizures. And this young boy was basically having this uprolling of the eyes and thought to be seizures, giving treatment. And actually, this is a very rare, not very common condition, the paroxysmal tonic up gaze. So it's like a brief oculogyric crisis. Of course, it's not an oculogyric crisis, but and the patient is absolutely fine at this time. And these are ticks. This little boy, there he goes. And he can control it if made to. That's the big thing about ticks. You tell them to stop and they will stop. They can stop. I don't know whether I managed to do it. I think I did it over here. I threatened that I gave him an injection and he stopped. You can see ticks also can look like seizures. What about classification issues? So this has already told you about the different classification of seizures in 2017. And a few months later, we had classification of the epilepsies. Now, how is the pediatric... What, how is this benefit of pediatrics? So I think the most important thing is in the spasms. Now we have a separate type called epileptic spasms, which are focal, generalized epileptic spasms, and even which sometimes when we don't know the onset. So basically, these are very typically in childhood. If you look at many of these seizures, myoclonic atonic, atonic, absence, eyelid myoclonia, Many of them are really conditions which occur in kids. So it's really important that these things have been given their due place in the classification. And this is the classification of the epilepsies. And we look at it first, the seizure types, focal, generalized, unknown, and epilepsy, the same thing combined. This is a very important group because it has, sometimes you have seizures of both types, focal and generalized in the same patient. So it's combined, for example, the Lennox-Gastaut syndrome and unknown, and then finally there is specific syndromes, which are very typically seen in pediatric nature. Then you go to the etiology, look at the comorbidities at the end of the classification or the end of the clinical examination, you have a general idea what's gonna happen in the future. The problem with the classification is also there. For example, as you know, seizure types are based, you also have to talk about impaired awareness, but how do you judge impaired awareness and delay children infancy is very difficult. Second thing is, how do you get the aura history? Much of the focal seizures, so-called, to find out where they're coming from, where they originate, you need the aura. And there's little help from the history from children who are the only ones who know what they're experiencing, really. Focal epilepsies in children can present as generalized seizures. And I'll show you an example. And often the EEG may be bilateral when the you know, in, in, in patients who have a little more severe epilepsy. Usually, of course, it's not that way. And MRIs are often normal, and home windows, though very useful, may not capture the onset. But look at this boy. He's having these drug resistant jerks, clusters on awakening. He comes in for a brief, there he goes. There's a little focal focality, the eyes go to the left. Stops, he again starts playing. There he goes. So it's a cluster, and this is obviously all of you must have realized this is infantile spasm. If you look at his MRI, clearly, because we use the MRI for classification. So clearly, this is going to focal epileptic spasms. Of course, this patient was operated and is fine. And then there's evolution of seizure semiology. So this is a you know, same kid at different ages. At six months, He's having these funny eye movements. There it goes. 
which are again in clusters and which are one type of ocular spasms. A few months later, he gets, there he goes. Huh. It's a flexor jerk, which again comes in clusters, extensor and flexor. There he goes again. And then finally, he develops focal seizures at the age of two years. So really, it's peculiar because evolution occurs over time. And it's very difficult to therefore give one diagnosis. You may have to change your diagnosis you know, over time. Then you come to the epilepsies and the syndromes, which are seen in, specifically in kids. I mean, this, you know, so I'll just tell you, look at this bunch of syndromes. And then I've just classified my own classification into what is called the good syndromes, the ones which are not too bad. And they come at different ages, so benign neonatal seizures in the first month or so, they may go on to three months, benign infantile seizures, which come on a little later, myoclonic epilepsy, the most important, which I will give you a little bit of information, because that's what many of you may be seeing in your practice, is febrile seizures, and the different variants of that. And then the others, important ones are self-limiting, focal epilepsy, child absence, and the idiopathic generalized epilepsy. And then you, luckily, most of you don't deal with these horrible conditions like epileptic spasms and Dravet syndrome and LGS and not so good, I would say, and difficult. And this is the ones who are referred for treatment. Sorry, referred for treatment because, you know, it's, it's important to realize that uh, these need a comprehensive epilepsy center for good results. So let's go to febrile seizures. What is accepted? There are two types, simple febrile seizures, come between six months and six years. Fever is noticed before or after, but straddling the 24 hours. Then you have complex febrile seizures. And there are three things which make it complex. Prolonged, so 10, 15 minutes, focal, and multiple. And then sometimes they have 5% or so have status epilepticus. So basically, these are the two important, and maybe the three important types of febrile seizures. There's a small risk of missing meningitis. So when, when you think of meningitis, when they are young babies, when they have status, and when they have prolonged post periods. And EEG and imaging are not indicated even when they are complex febrile seizures, except for the few exceptions, which I will just tell you about. So recurrence risks are mainly if they're early onset, below the age of one year, there's positive family history, and the baby gets seizures with very low temp, like for example, 100 degrees and she gets a baby, baby gets a seizure. That means they have a higher chance of getting seizures, recurrent febrile seizures, not epilepsy. Treatment, just give midazolam, antipyretics do not prevent recurrence, but make the baby comfortable. Midazolam nasally is the most useful in our, in our setting. And intermittent benzodiazepines, typically clobazam, can be used just for if the mothers are all very, very anxious. Long-term treatment never used generally. And if there's a status epilepticus and it's febrile, try and avoid phenytoin and other sodium channel blockers because they don't work most of the times in febrile seizures. Then you come to the generalized epilepsies. Okay. And I, okay, these are many of the good ones and some of the bad ones. So this group, of course, is what many of you will see juvenile absence, myoclonic, generalized tonic, tonic seizures, which are usually adolescent onset. And then there's childhood absence, which I will just touch upon. I think Shudhi has already shown you a very nice video. And then there are these rare absences, which luckily most of you will not see because they can be fairly refractory to treatment. This is an important one, which many of you may not be familiar with. It's called genetic epilepsy with febrile seizure plus, or the Jeff's plus spectrum, which is looks like febrile seizures, but they have a different prognosis. So let's look at this. So these are febrile seizures coming either too early or a little late. So before the age of six months, sometimes maybe a little later than that, or they come at four, five, six years. And they sometimes persist. So instead of going away at six years, they go away at 10 years, 12 years. But they come only with fever initially. Later on, they may develop without fever, so afebrile seizures, what we then may call, the current day febrile will be calling it epilepsy. Milestones also are not completely okay. Sometimes they may be normal, but we did a study where we found that many of them have delayed language. So they speak a little late, they're not too good in their learning, etc. And there may be different types of seizures, generalized, focal, sometimes myoclonic absence. And the most important thing is the family history. 
And the peculiar thing is some of the people in the family will have epilepsy, some will have febrile seizures, some will have... So whenever you have a family history of epilepsy in a patient with febrile seizures, look out for this syndrome. And many times, of course, the newer genetic markers have come out. And there are many genes which are associated with these, but though not very consistently. This you already seen. So basically, this is a childhood absence epilepsy, typically comes between five and eight. After eight and 10, you have juvenile absence, and typically they have three hertz spike wave. And these are the nice types of epilepsy to have. Most of them go away fairly uh, easily in about two years. They respond very well to treatment, but the problem is what do you treat it with? Everybody uses Valproate, but actually speaking, ethosuximide, which is now available in India, is the first choice. The Valproid and Ethosuximide are equally effective. If adverse events, we are much more with Valproid, hyperactivity, etc. So you should try and use Ethosuximide first, unless the patient has generalized tonic clonic seizures as well. The third medicine, which is very useful in refractory cases, is Lamotrigine, but that is hardly ever used in the initial. And this you already see in a nice video of generalized you know, photosensitive myoclonic seizures of the upper limbs mainly in the adolescent girl, and you get these polyspike discharges, typical myoclonic epilepsy. And these are a spectrum. You may have myoclonus, you may have absence, you may have generalized tonic clonic in the same patient, you may have separate. So that's the way you look at it. And if you look at the treatment, I mean, we know that the old study of Sanad, which is 2007, Valtor still remains the most efficacious as compared to lamotrigine and topiramate. In 19, it is compared to levetiracetam and still remains most efficacious. So it is definitely the best drug to use, but the problem is in adolescent girls and young women with this, we avoid Valproid, primarily because of endocrine effects, the teratogenicity in, in pregnancy, et cetera. And we try to use lamotrigine. And then the other ones which come up, are topiramate, zonizamide, and recent addition, of parampanel, which is a new drug, which is used in <laughs> drug-resistant IgEs. And then you have the self-limiting focal epilepsies. This is a young boy, who gets up in the night, he's having seizures around the mouth. He's having twitching, but you may have drooling, you may have you know, any way to talk. He's fully conscious, but he can't speak. And this is Bex typically has these seizures from the center, IEDs from the central temporal regions with massive sleep activation. Sometimes can become pretty bad. I'll show you an example. Or you have the Panatopoulos syndrome, what I think um, <clears throat> Sudeep talked about as benign occipital epilepsy. Now it's called self-limiting focal epilepsies from the occipital region. And this kid gets up, he's awake, he's answering his mom. And he keeps, I just show you, he keeps looking to the right, says he's got a headache. Sorry, it's gone off. And then he vomits, and I think that's where they lost the video. So these patients who get up in the night, look at the right side, vomit, and look to one side, start vomiting. Remember, there may be actually this particular syndrome because they don't really get anything else. And the same group of conditions occurring in adults and in sorry older children is called the gastro syndrome where you see these colored balls this is exactly what a kid has actually drawn what he sees so you may see these different colored balls they come abruptly and the main way of differentiating from migraine is the way they come abruptly and the fact that they are colored migraine auras are usually black and white and then you have the bad epilepsies the bad syndromes and of course one is this particular Baby who's got, oh God, sorry, I'm just hanging. Okay, I was going to show you a spasm. Let me see if I can go back. Not playing. Okay, well, the spasms, I already shown you one uh, spasm. So what's happened to this? Oh God. 
I'm sorry, but this is the first one. The one side is showing a flexor spasm. You can see that the, the evidence of tuberous sclerosis, which is a common part, the hip salinity, et cetera. But, and this one is, of course, a asymmetric spasm. So it's happening mainly on the right side, and it's happening there. It is. I've already shown you one asymmetric spasm. The important thing is steroids and Viga battery. These are the only important things which you should realize. And don't worry about ACTH, it's expensive, you admit the kid for a day or two, but you can use high dose prednisolone as well, four to six milligrams per kilo. It's almost as good. So you use this always in the beginning because it's the best thing to prevent mental retardation which can follow later. And Vigabatin is the second drug. Of course, in tuberous sclerosis, you use it first. Otherwise, it's the one which you use second, or you can use it together. And there are many others. Important thing is the ketogenic diet, which I'll just touch upon, but it's very useful in refractory spasms. Let's look at another bad syndrome, the Dravet syndrome, which is a type of Jeff spectrum. So it's the worst type of the Jeff's spectrum. So this is earlier seizures, all febrile, usually complex, focal, and they have photosensitive seizures, which come in the second year, is triggered by anything hot. So fever, infection, hot baths, weather, etc. So avoid all those things in treatment. And initially they look normal. They look absolutely normal kids, but they have a horrible prognosis. It all goes south in the second year, third year, and then they develop all sorts of things and doesn't really stop. And one of the reasons it worsens is because of sodium channel blockers. And these things are very important. This can actually worsen them. So we may actually worsen the prognosis. These three drugs, tiripentol, cannabidiol, which is a derivative of marijuana, and fenfluramine are all specific drugs, but we don't have them available. So we usually use the common ones like valproate, clobazam, topiramate, and zonazamide. And again, here, the ketogenic diet may help. So there are many things you can do, but the prognosis is not good. And like I said, this is the Jeff's Plus spectrum. Again, the sodium channel mutation, and SMEI is the other term, the older term for Dravet syndrome. And these basically are de novo, that means the parents don't have the gene very often. And the important thing is remember vaccine encephalopathy. I know many of you guys must be remembering the vaccine, DPT vaccine encephalopathy, they may have this. The other thing is ISIS. And this is the, for example, the Bex case I've shown you. If you give them carbamazepine or something, they might develop this. And this usually comes in school going. The important thing is it may not be having any seizures at all. This kid has seizures, and she's showing you evidence of epileptic negative myoclonus. I made her put her hand up, and her hand she can't maintain. She keeps coming down. And that happens sometimes, not always. 30-40% may not have epilepsy at all. And it resolves by adolescence, but unfortunately, this has its price you pay in the form of academics and cognitive changes, etc. Treatment also is unsatisfactory. We use steroids and ethosuximide, et etc. And you again avoid sodium channel blockers. So carbamazepine, etc., avoided in many of these syndromes. The last thing I'm going to show you is developmental epileptic encephalopathy. Just to tell you, this is coming in the very early life multiple seizures, they're always delayed, even before the epilepsy comes up sometimes. They're very drug resistant, they have terrible EEG abnormalities, and they're not something which many of you are gonna see, but we must know, because there's a lot of genetic data which is coming up in this. Many of them are produce, are, are, have these specific genes, for example, the ones you may remember are pyridoxin responsive epilepsy, the GLUT1 deficiency syndrome, the glucose transmitter defect, which does not allow glucose to go into the CNS and that response to the ketogenic diet. Uh, and like I said, the pyridoxin and the pyridoxin phosphate, the, some of them respond to sodium channel blockers and others you avoid them. So there are lots of things you can do specifically. One thing I must mention over here is tuberous sclerosis. So now you know this is something to do with the mTOR pathway and you want to inhibit the mTOR pathway. And that's why you use mTOR pathway inhibitors. So specific drugs, precision medicine, so to speak, has come in in the last 10 years or so. Etiology, structural etiology in kids, as you can see, cystic circus and, you know, bad epilepsies and like posterior gliosis, dysplasias, things he's already talked about that, Sujith. 
Then you have genetics. Remember, about the age of 10 years, genetics is very poor yield. So in younger kids, etc., maybe worth doing. Mostly complex inheritance, structural genetic overlap is there in some disorders, infections like SSP, etc., can cause, metabolic things can cause, immune like NMDAR. So I won't go into details. But the most important thing is unknown. That's a group we have large numbers of because we don't investigate our kids as much as uh, the, the Western hemisphere does. And that's why the, many patients are not diagnosed. And remember, there's a lot of comorbidities in epilepsy. There's a lot of LD, learning disorders, attention problems, in, in intellectual disability, you know, depression, et cetera, which can go along with epilepsy, sometimes worsened by the epilepsy, often worsened by the epilepsy. And systemic, you can see many kids are obese, have migraine, and it's very important is sleep. And these are important things when you consider what drugs to choose. So you must use your uh, comorbidities to guide you what kind of drug you should use. So this is the last two, three slides on treatment strategies. What do you expect from drug treatment to reduce risk of recurrence, avoid significant adverse events, and improve quality of life? Generally, remember, anti-seizure drugs do not influence long-term seizure. So 70% of childhood epilepsy will, whether you give treatment or not, will remit by two years. So it's really a symptomatic treatment. That's what we are trying to do. So when you have the first unprovoked seizure, comes into your clinic, first you must, of course, make sure it's a seizure and make sure it's not an acute provoked seizure. It's not like a meningitis or, you know, some metabolic condition or whatever it is, like hypoglycemia or whatever. And once you are sure about that, and you decide to give it, try and avoid chronic anti-therapy uh, in normal kids with brief seizure, first seizure and normal EEG MRIs, those who may have self-limiting focal epilepsies and only use midazolam. Easier said than done, our, our parents don't accept it. Very often they want, they're so anxious. Consider treatment in those with abnormal development, abnormal MRIs, first episode of uh, status epilepticus. I use it sometimes in adolescents, first seizure, but the daytime seizures, you know, they want to maintain an independent lifestyle. You know, they are to go in front of their friends, et cetera. You might want to use treatment early. And of course, a parental. Ah, this is an important slide, special considerations. Remember, all drugs are equally efficacious. First drug, first uh, unprovoked seizure, whether you use old ones, new ones, the one that separates the men from the boys is the adverse events. And that's where newer drugs score without question. Comorbidities must be considered. So for example, if you have ASD, autism, or ADHD, do not use levetiracetam, do not use benzodiazepines, do not use phenobarb, especially if you have sleep problems as well. Avoid carbamazepine and oxcarbazepine as first line in, in, in infants. This is not fine, this is line, first line treatment in infants, because sometimes they can get exacerbation. You know, like I showed you those cases. Avoid phenytoin as the first line also, because phenytoin syrup, very poorly bioavailable. Very narrow therapeutic window. You do frequent levels. You get cosmetic long-term effect, especially in girls. That's why it's best to avoid it. Only in the acute situation, you can use it for a short time. And remember, cost and availability most important. Because there was many studies have shown that many Indian children just don't follow what you're told because they don't understand the, what you're talking about. They think it's a cost. You really have to spend a lot of time. And for you know, general physicians, general practitioners, pediatricians, maybe prudent refer to the neurologist or an epilepsy center if you have an epilepsy in infancy, because those are deadly sometimes, drug resistant epilepsy, so maybe two or maximum three ASDs in mono combination therapy. You know, adults use a two year rule, waiting timeline, not applicable in young children. It's a critical period when they are developing and you might really screw it up if you wait for two years to get control. Pre-surgical evaluation absolutely must be advised early and therefore comprehensive epilepsy centers, which luckily are growing all over the country, like who also offer ketogenic diet, different types. You must, for anybody who has developmental arrest, a little bit of history on what's happening to the kid as far as developmental and behavior, et cetera. And finally, the MRI is abnormal, best is to send it to a neurologist or epilepsy center. Summary is epilepsy in kids are different in many aspects. 
physiological movement disorders more often seizure mimics in young children rather than psychogenic and non-epileptic movement disorders. Age-related syndromes are typically seen in children. Effects on development and school performance are absolutely critical, especially in drug-resistant epilepsies, because this is all happening during the critical period of development, the first five years of life especially. Genetic testing, high yield, when you have bad epilepsies in infants and children, you don't need to do it in kids with mild epilepsy or older kids. Just avoid it. And the threshold for referral to a center should be low. Pre-surgical and non-drug therapies where they can take advantage of them. And remember, these things very often, comorbidities sometimes become more of a problem later in the seizures. Thank you very much. And um, uh, I invite you to the Hindu National Hospital when any of you visit Mumbai. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Dhani, for such a wonderful talk and taking us through the entire spectrum of uh, pediatric epilepsy and all the types of different ep epilepsies and in such a short period of time and so lucidly. So, as I said, the questions are, uh, of course, uh, at the end. Uh, and it is my pleasure to invite the next speaker, uh, Professor Sita Jayalakshmi uh, from the Krishna Institute of Medical Sciences. Uh, Dr. Sita Jayalakshmi, again, is a very good friend, but um, highly, highly committed to, the, uh, to epilepsy. And um, she has an excellent uh, surgical program running in her institute, which she has established along with her neurosurgical colleagues. Uh, so, Dr. Sita is uh, today going to be talking on the other end of the spectrum from children, we move on to elderly, and um, it's my great pleasure to invite uh, Dr. Sita Jayalakshmi to speak on epilepsy in the elderly. Dr. Yes. Sita, please. Thank you. Thank you, Gagandi, for the kind words, and also I thank IAN and uh, uh, API for giving me this opportunity. I will be talking briefly about the management of epilepsy in the elderly. I'll take you through the etiology of epilepsy in the elderly because the causes are totally different from that of the children and the adults. The Shizer semiology, how it is different from adults and how do you evaluate the elderly population? How, how do you manage? And all of us know that the population is uh, aging all across the globe and especially in India also and hence uh, Epilepsy in the elderly has its own unique uh, uh, issues for the management. And about 25% of the new onset seizures do occur in the elderly. And it is the third most common cause of neurological problem in the elderly after uh, stroke and dementia. And uh, so it's very important because any sudden unexpected seizure in elderly is associated with poor quality of life affecting their health status, functional independence because of the aging already, they have a lot of issues. And hence it is the safe and effective appropriate management of epilepsy in the elderly based on the comorbidities. That's very important in the management. If you look at the incidence and prevalence of epilepsy in the elderly, it varies between, normally if you see the incidence is about 0.7% in the age of 55 to 64. Elderly means usually the definition is 60 years or above 65 years in uh, based on the various studies. So if it is 0.7% uh, if it is in the fifth decade, by the time it is uh, they are 88th and ninth decade, it reaches to 1.2%, means one in every 100 will develop a seizure. And if you look at the longitudinal changes in the incidence of epilepsy, from 1986 to 2002, there is no significant change. If you see the epilepsy in the elderly is almost, uh, um, I mean, the graph is similar in both the ages and about 25% of the new onset seizures occurred after the age of 65 years of age. Then what are the etiologies of epilepsy in the elderly? The commonest cause of seizures in elderly is stroke, which is responsible for almost nearly uh, two thirds of the cases. If you see the red color indicates the vascular etiology. This is followed by, uh, because most of the stroke patients 
uh, do develop a gliosis and they develop post stroke epilepsy we do not cause the acute seizures associated with the stroke as epilepsy we call them as acute post stroke seizures and then the other etiologies include tumors metabolic and toxic etiologies traumatic inflammation and dementia so the evaluation of these patients uh, is very important but one should really know that all falls in elderly are not seizures because they have many other issues so whenever somebody comes with an episode of loss of consciousness we should not label them as epilepsy uh, because syncope is very common in elderly which may be because of underlying cardiac conditions like arrhythmias um, or because of associated uh, valvular disturbances or even associated ischemic heart disease or most importantly elderly can have orthostatic hypotension leading to syncope episodes followed by sometimes following syncope some convulsive movements may be there and then only we should lay once we rule out all this by a very good history one should be able to identify whether it is epilepsy and most important is psychogenic epilepsies are not uncommon for elderly which are seen in up to 3% of the cases in the elderly population then and how do we really when we are taking the history uh, the key important things i have highlighted in the red color the premonitory symptoms like aura are not uncommon but if it present it suggests a seizure but whereas in syncope there is a prodrome of light headedness and excessive sweating whereas the movements in elderly also are not so common the tonic clonic movements if they occur it helps but however they are they are not they are not they are usually uncommon but the eeg definitely helps especially if you do within the first 24 to 48 hours which can show the epileptic form discharges whereas syncope is so sometimes syncope can be followed by some myoclonic jerks are some clonic jerks which should not be mistaken as seizures and over diagnosis also is not uncommon in elderly the reasons for the over diagnosis is sometimes a transient ischemic like like sensory phenomena may be mistaken as a sensory seizure transient global amnesia has to be differentiated from transient epileptic amnesia the only way to differentiate is good history where in epileptic amnesia they are, do not remember and do not follow the commands whereas in tga they may appear to be normal and also the eeg is abnormal in transient epileptic amnesia and then other one is the restless leg movements in the sleep may be mistaken for seizures in the elderly and most important is patients with uh, diabetes suddenly can have episodes of hypoglycemia possibly leading to a seizure so then we do not need to treat them uh, continuously so one should be careful whether it is an acute symptomatic seizure as i already said psychogenic non epileptic seizures kept, should be kept in mind and in addition the most important is the cardiovascular syncope or orthostatic hypotension arrhythmias or the structural like uh, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy is leading to syncope episodes which should not be mistaken for um, uh, seizures and among the sleep disorders most important is obstructive sleep apnea where there is accumulation of the carbon dioxide which may sometimes precipitate a seizure and also the hypnic jerks may be mistaken for seizures so one should be careful and also one should be uh, always taking uh, the good history for what are the drugs which are being taken recently we had a patient who took tramadol and immediately developed a unconsciousness with some jerky movements so drugs can cause seizure uh, like phenomena or a confusional state which can be mistaken for seizures so one should be very careful about this especially the antidepressants can cause uh, this in addition to analgesics uh, like uh, uh, morphine deli uh, related derivatives and under diagnosis is also common in elderly because most of the time uh, the children uh, go to work and they will be living alone without an eye witness when they become suddenly unconscious or they may be having cognitive issues and may not be able to come out with a history carefully and uh, by the time we see uh, the patient may be only having a confusional state which may be because of the post ictal state or they may be it may be because of the non convulsive phenomena occurring or it may be due to associated for example you can have a seizure in the setting of hyponatremia which can cause uh, which can aggravate the seizures the etiology of may be different it may not be because of hyponatremia and memory disturbances because especially those who have dementia may not be able to give a proper history about aura and what happened and sometimes post ictal psychosis also do uh, occur and it can uh, Uh, complicate the picture in such cases the most important is the electroencephalogram so what is the seizure semiology that is the features of the seizures in the elderly the if you see the yellow color depicts the focal impaired awareness seizures that is nothing but the patient will be 
uh, staring uh, and uh, confused or uh, some and followed by the motor seizures which are seen in 25% where you have motor movements so if you and then uh, some seizures are only focal aware means that is something like a focal uh, partial seizures so if you see here the tonic clonic seizures are seen in only one fourth of the cases uh, and in addition as i already said uh, uh, in, in a video EG study, one third of the patients had non-epileptic uh, events. Uh, and the classic ARA may not be present. Automatisms and GTCS are less common in the elderly. So if you see, uh, this is a video EG basic study uh, where when the elderly are compared with the young adults uh, uh, in this um, uh, review article, if the epileptic ARAs are more common in young people. Confusion is more common with elderly, but not in the young. Multiple phases of evaluation, evolution are common with uh, uh, young adults. Generalized tonic-clonic seizures are more in young than elderly. And postictal uh, sleepiness and un unresponsiveness is more common with the elderly. And most of the time, so they come with sudden episodes of loss of consciousness. When we evaluate cardiac, everything will be normal. And in such conditions, definitely we should consider whether it is a seizure. So this is a 78-year-old uh, a gentleman who presented with these episodes occurring frequently. He is tapping his right hand, shouting some oral automatisms. Then posturing of the left hand and he turned his head and eyes towards the left side. Then it is evolving. And now the seizure is over. So this is a typical case of hypomotor seizures with right hand automatisms uh, with some uh, motor component in the form of head and eye deviation. So this is definitely a seizure. But if you see this other guy again, who gets many episodes in the day? So he gets sudden movements of the hands and the legs with restlessness. Actually, this turned out to be a non-epileptic event. So non-epileptic events do occur even in the elderly. Here it is very brief. The eyes are open. So we were not very sure. So we had to do a video EEG to differentiate between a non-epileptic event and a complex, the hypomotor seizures. Then how do we evaluate these elderly? Definitely very important is good, good clinical history. That is how did the event start? Does he have any premonition? Any aura is present? Any uh, whether he has any sweating to differentiate from our palpitations to differentiate it from the cardiac? And also during the event, we should ask for any automatisms or tonic-clonic movements. Uh, and also postictally, uh, if there is any tongue bite or urinary incontinence. Urinary incontinence is not uncommon even during the syncope. But if tongue bite is there, definitely it is majorly towards the um, seizure. And after that, we should do a uh, review the drug history, review the ECG. Everybody with an episode of unconsciousness should undergo because following even a cardiac event, one can have a seizure. So we can we should we must do a good cardiac evaluation with ECG, Holter monitoring, metabolic screening. The basic workup is important. CSF analysis is not required in all the cases. Uh, and uh, uh, neurologically, one should do a good interictal EEG. Uh, possibly for uh, two to three hours. And if it is positive, definitely helps in the confirmation. And VEG, VEG monitoring is required when we are not sure and if the attacks are frequent. And an MRI brain is a must in every um, elderly patient, even after a single seizure. Then coming to the management. What are the management problems? Uh, there is a frequent misdiagnosis of epilepsy in the elderly. Uh, then the frequent comorbidities, especially associated strokes, dementia, underlying cardiac conditions, already on multiple drugs, and when you are adding another drug, the patient is very unhappy. And also enhance the risk of adverse drug reactions when we are using the anti seizure medication. And uh, most of the time, the drugs used are levetiracetam, lamotrazine, or comes a slow releasing carbamazepine. But at the same time, we should be aware of the pharmacokinetics and dynamics of the anti seizure medications. So, so as I already said, underdiagnosis uh, is not uncommon. 
long postictal confusion sometimes uh, makes us uh, get confused and there is a high morbidity and mortality during the seizures and also sometimes they can evolve into status epilepticus uh, and also there is a high risk of recurrence of the seizures in elderly anywhere between 40 to 90 percent and hence even a single seizure must be treated in the elderly and the treatment should be continued what are the treatment goals uh, it is achieving the seizure freedom preserving the independence of the elderly preventing falls especially using the drugs which will not affect the bone health and managing the multiple medications. The unique issues are susceptibility to adverse drug effects as well as pharmacokinetics, pharmacodynamics of the uh, drugs which are used along with the anti seizure medication because of the drug-to-drug -drug interactions. And in a survey, it has been shown that 50% of the residents receiving anti seizure medications has at least six or more medications, uh, suggesting the high drug burden in these individuals. As I already said, the comorbidities are depression, strokes, hypertension, gait issues, osteoporosis, associated chronic kidney diseases, and diabetes is almost uh, very common in all the elderly. Then how do you do the patient management? Uh, so whenever you are managing, as a rule, the anti seizure agents which are appropriate for children are mostly appropriate even for the older adults. We should start with very low doses and slowly titrate the medication over a period of at least two weeks. And elderly will be very sensitive to adverse effects because already they have a co cognitive reserve is less. So we should use drugs which will not affect their cognition, will not cause significant ataxia and also drug toxicity. So <clears throat> what about managing the single seizure in the elderly? As the risk of recurrence is 40 to 50%, every, even after a single seizure, one should start them on anti seizure medication because of high risk of recurrence. What is the evidence we have from the literature? <clears throat> in the UK Lemotrazine study, study, it has been shown that Lemotrazine is accepted as an acceptable choice for the initial treatment of elderly patients with newly diagnosed epilepsy. Then what about the use of AED in the elderly? Uh, it, so the, the, what is the evidence available is that whenever Lemotrazine was compared with Carbamazepine, there is no difference in the retention rate or the side effects. But however, what about levetiracetam, which is widely used? So the efficacy and safety of levetiracetam is well established as add-on treatment in the elderly with focal epilepsy with the safe and efficacious, uh, uh, as a safe and efficacious treatment. And when it is compared with carbamazepine, levetiracetam scored over carbamazepine in newly diagnosed epilepsy in the elderly, which is a randomized double-blind control study. Then even the recently we have, uh, and hence we can use safely control release carbamazepine, lemetrazine or levetiracetam. But what about the newer drugs that is lacosamide and brivaracetam? So this is a very interesting, uh, there are few studies available. Um, so when, whenever lacosamide was used, uh, it, it has been found that the efficacy and tolerability of lacosamide as monotherapy was favorable even at low doses in older patients compared to levetiracetam. Uh, during a long-term uh, uh, treatment. Long, uh, levetiracetam was used in almost 2,000 milligrams plus, whereas uh, levetiracetam with 200 milligrams. But what we find in practice is even low doses of lacos uh, lacosamide was as good as, uh, uh, and it's, I, I feel it scores over levetiracetam because levetiracetam is associated with behavioral side effects. But however, if the patient has associated cardiac issues, one should avoid lacosamide. And this is about a good meta and network meta analysis. What is about the role of newer AEDs, in which they have compared, they did a network analysis of lacosamide, lamotrazine, levetiracetam. And the conclusion of the study is uh, there is no significant in the no significance in the efficacy between lacosamide, lamotrazine, levetiracetam, but they but they, they have highest probability of having a uh, she's a freedom. Though they did not score over the first line AEDs, that is carbamazepine, either uh, uh, long acting or um, immediate releasing preparation, the tolerability was better with newer AEDs. And hence, the levetiracetam, levetiracetam, and lacosamide are preferred over carbamazepine because of the best tolerability. But even um, uh, levetiracetam and valproate was also compared. And again, these newer drugs scored over levetiracetam and valproate, possibly because of the associated drug interactions and the mood disturbances with levetiracetam. So 
the new anti seizure medications what is the role because we are using more and more uh, the advantage of this is low risk of uh, drug interactions which is very important in the elderly uh, once daily formulations are possible especially with long acting uh, uh, you can use oxcarbazepine and even levetiracetam perempenal uh, still we need more data because it can cause significant behavioral issues and falls and better to avoid using it in adults elderly and especially in the emergencies brevaratus mesetum and lacosamide also useful in the emergency setups so finally the this is the summary of the various studies which finally suggest that lamotrigine gabapentin levetiracetam are uh, better and among the newer drugs lacosamide is uh, there is some evidence brevaratum we need more trials but still in practice we find it to be very useful in elderly because by using 100 to 200 mg uh, uh, the seizure control is relatively good so what is the response uh, to the aeds in the elderly it's excellent because more than 80% of the elderly became seizure free and remain on the anti epileptic drugs but still some uh, 15 to 20% do have a drug refractory epilepsy even in the elderly so if you look at the guidelines given by ilae and also american epilepsy society and american academy of neurology among the guidelines uh, level a evidence is available for lamotrigine this is because of the many number of trials which are available for carbamazepine it is level c evidence uh, and uh, for other drugs we need still more data to come into the guidelines because this was in 2013 and then the adverse effects in the elderly are similar to any age uh, more important is nowadays we do not use phenytoin much because of the effect on the cardiac conduction disturbances cognition and also cns side effects carbamazepine in low doses it's useful valproate more side important side effect is it causing tremors in the elderly who already may have some baseline tremor and then interaction with the other drugs especially which are metabolized in the liver and hence lamotrigine and levetiracetam are better but lamotrigine needs to be uptreated very slowly because of the risk of development of the rash levetiracetam can cause mood abnormalities which needs to be observed because elderly can have some baseline depression because of uh, various uh, reasons and topiramate jones my tolerance is very less and hence one and oxcarbazepine carbamazepine one should be careful about hyponatremia any elderly comes with uh, uh, drowsiness dullness one should do a sodium in these individuals and better uh, that's why we avoid using this and as i already said the polypharmacy during polypharmacy one should be very careful about the drug interactions which leads to non adherence and, uh, and especially they are an anticoagulants anti hypertensives statins anti arrhythmic medications psychotropic medications hence so, uh, interactions should be understood between the uh, anti seizure medication and these drugs so, most important is those who are metabolized by the liver like carbamazepine phenytoin sodium valproate better to avoid uh, and then uh, drugs which have mainly the drugs lacosamide levetiracetam the interactions with the liver are less uh, and they have mainly renal metabolism may be better to use and even brevaracetam is good then the aed related side effects as already said lamotrigine is associated with skin rash and then drug refractory epilepsy does occur in the elderly individuals with late onset epilepsy generally achieve seizure freedom with lower doses of aed but drug refractory epilepsy is seen in up to 21% when compared to 51% in the young patients as per the drug refractory epilepsy criteria so whenever an elderly person has got drug resistant epilepsy means need, needing more than uh, two drugs one should always confirm whether it is epilepsy because there are so many non epileptic events which may mimic epilepsy one should do a video eeg also to rule out non epileptic events and also should have an ecg lead to rule out associated cardiac disturbances review the lifestyle and most important is autoimmune epilepsies like uh, hashimotos uh, thyroiditis uh, leading uh, also associated with encephalitis and others uh, like uh, autoimmune uh, epilepsy should be considered so the last question is is it possible to withdraw the drug therapy the answer is uh, extreme caution and uh, uh, consider withdrawing if they are seizure free for more than 5 years not like 2 to 3 years in young people mri is normal eeg is normal but otherwise always better to continue the aed because of the risk of a seizure is very high leading to injuries i always uh, request if they have two or more than two seizures to continue the aed uh, after explaining the risks and benefits most of the elderly would like to continue the um, aed because they do not want uh, 
the risk of having uh, injuries. So to summarize, epilepsy in the elderly is different from young adults. No single drug is ideal. But the, um, as per the available armamentarium of anti seizure medications, the safe drugs which can be used are lamotrazine, levetiracetam, lacosamide, and brevaracetam, and possibly to some extent sodium valproate. Individualized choice of the AEDs based on the comorbidities associated with the cardiac, liver, and renal condition, one should choose the AED which is good for them, and that should be the golden rule in the clinical practice. Thank you. So uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Sita, for uh, uh, taking us through the challenges of uh, management of epilepsy in the elderly. Uh, and of course, uh, bringing out the salient features, <clears throat> how important it is, how common it is, is something which we often tend to ignore. So thank you very much for this wonderful and very enthusiastic uh, talk. Uh, we go over to the last topic and the last speaker, uh, Professor Sangeeta Rawat, who is uh, the Dean and uh, Professor and Head of Neurology Department at the KEM Hospital, Mumbai. Uh, she is going to be talking on women in epilepsy, which um, this is for the benefit of the audience that it is um, nonetheless, an extremely important topic. There are a number of issues which need to be kept in mind. Uh, and uh, while managing uh, women with epilepsy, and uh, I think there can be no other better person than uh, Dr. Sangeeta Rawat to address this important issue. Yeah, good evening and thank you, uh, Dr. Tiwari and Dr. Nirmal Surya for arranging this API uh, you know, physicians of in, uh, India and having interactions with neurologists. And I think after COVID, this online thing has really become very, very uh, prevalent and very, very popular. And thanks, Gagan, for your kind introduction. So, uh, woman with epilepsy itself is, uh, uh, you know, a big challenge because we, in a, as a woman, we have... Uh, to give a birth to a child and that, that causes lots of difference between a man and woman. So I'll be covering my talk, the following, uh, are all the topics during my, this 20 minutes talk. So let's go over to the, now seizures can develop at any stage in the woman's life, but pregnant women constitute almost 0.5% of all pregnancies and 25 to 30% of them have increased seizures during the pregnancy. Approximately half, one half million women with epilepsy are of childbearing age. And uh, important thing is that 95% uh, of this pregnancy will have a good outcome. So you have to be very, very hopeful even with, when you are dealing with women that they can get married and can have a normal child. So the goal is together with the team management, you have to have effective control of maternal seizure with a list risk to the fetus. So now let's start from the beginning. What happens during puberty and epilepsy? So at puberty, there is a rise in the uh, FSH and LH, gradual increase in estrogen. The estro it's important to remember this one line that estrogen is epileptogenic and progesterone is protective. So whenever there is a marked increase in estrogen, like prior to ovulation, there might be increase in the seizure frequency. And when there is a fall of progesterone post-menstruation, there might be again increase in seizure activity. So epileptic activity affects the endocrine function and hypothalamic by inducing this the epileptic uh, waves may also go to the pituitary hypothalamus and may cause alteration in LH pulsatility. So this is a simple uh, chart which is showing that there is a before ovulation, estrogen is increased. So that is this is increased, so there is one uh, period where you can get increased seizures. And then, then this is a protected period because the progesterone is high. And once it falls, again, the, the decreased progesterone just before menstruation, there is again increased vulnerability in a person with uh, having menstrual cycles and uh, normal cycles and epilepsy. So how does menstruation get affected in epileptic? First of all, it has epilepsy-induced LH pulsatility, which I already said. 
Then AD itself, like especially like a valproate that causes PCODs and that may cause disruption in the endocrine function. And lots of psychosocial factors due to the chronicity of this epilepsy. All this together may cause irregular menstruation, increase in number of anovulatory cycles, and further leading to infertility because of the anovulatory cycles. And also there is increase in number of PCODs, that is polycystic ovarian diseases, either it is drug induced or due to the limbic or temporal lobe epilepsy itself causes this. So now what is termed as a cataminal epilepsy? The term cataminal is derived from catamenos, Greek words meaning mentally. So women with cataminal epilepsy have a cyclic exasperation of their seizures at certain points in their menstrual cycles and which are attributed to the fluctuations in the, their sex hormone. And it is reported in one third of the women with epilepsy may have this. In a large um, community-based survey, almost 28.2% women with epilepsy reported that they had, uh, when they were using the hormonal contraceptives, almost four to five times higher seizures compared to who were not on oral contraceptives. So even for this woman, when you are thinking of contraception also, you have to be careful because any hormonal change does uh, have a responsibility of causing more epilepsy as estrogen and progesterone fluctuations occur. So what is ketamine? There are three types which can occur, but I'll just tell you in brief that the first pattern is that during the perimenstruation C1 pattern, that is day minus two plus three around the menses. Second pattern is a periovulatory. This is the C2 pattern that is around the 14, 10 to 14 days. And the third pattern, this is mainly seen in the anovulatory cycle this is during entire luteal phase. It is 10 to minus 3. The most common is C1 pattern. So what, what do you do? Now, what happens during that? Uh, how do you manage this? There is alteration in fluid electrolyte balance, so you may have to use acetazolamide. Second way is cyclical AD treatment. So whichever anti-epileptic drug the person is on, you can either increase the dose of that anti-epileptic for those 6 to 7 days or 10 days whenever he has or you can add a clobazam 10 milligram for 10 days or seven days, whichever days uh, she has increased chances of cataminal epilepsy. And if everything doesn't act, then comes a hormonal intervention, which may be a premenstrual, you may give progesterone or antiestrogen or GnRH agonist. Now, the, in the West, this progesterone lozenges are easily available, but not so easily available in India. Uh, and so the other thing is that uh, you can try here is progesterone depo acetate 150 milligram every three months. And this reduces almost 39% over a one year period. So either a rosinges, which has to be given uh, as the chart is shown, or you can have this depo. Now, what are the cosmetic side effects of ASM? This is very important in women because definitely you all know that women would always like to look good. And if there is a cosmetic side effect, the compliance goes down. So the valproate and carbamazepine definitely causes weight gain. It also causes tremors. Topiramide, zonisamide causes weight loss. Valproate and levetiracetam causes hair loss. Phenytoin causes hirsutism, acne, coarsening of facial features, gingival hyperplasia. And there are many others. So significant impact on compliance is due to this cosmetic side effect. So whenever you are putting the girl, young girl or a you know a girl in ten uh, you know twenties and thirties, please do think about this cosmetic side effects and then choose your anti-epileptic drug. Now, how? What about the contraceptions? The serum AED levels uh, are in the hormones with COC are always going. Uh, you know, there is fluctuations in the sex hormone and this leads to the contraceptive failures and effects are due to liver enzymes induction, which is especially the estrogen component. And this differential effect is uh, more difficult to predict. So it is better that you uh, use non-oral -con contraceptive uh, like a barrier methods for this woman. And also the COC can induce the metabolism of certain ages, which will lower their blood levels. So the recommendation, if you want to give COC only, then you may use a given in combination with uh, drugs, which uh, by increasing the dose or tricycling COC. Tricycling is for three cycles. You continuously give without giving a break. And then you give a break where the menstruation is occurs. But most more effective that you use intrauterine devices 
or you have I am depot pre progesterone preparation, which are or a barrier methods. They may be more, uh, you know, uh, advisable for those who are on anti Caesar medications. Or you and also you should use the drugs like which does not have a significant side effect like lacosamide, levetiracetam, and zonisamide, uh, which are safer for uh, with oral contraceptive pills. Now, sec, motor, other major is a teratogenicity. Teratogenicity can be considered in three separate major malformations, fetal anti-epileptic drug syndromes, and long-term effects on the learning and cognitive function. Now, different drugs carry different risks. And the effects are dose dependent. So lower the dose, the less, plus also polypharmacy. If you have more than one drug, definitely the chances of uh, uh, teratogenicity increases. And the risk of malformation in second pregnancies are even higher if there was a malformation in the first. The teratogenicity effect of the newer drugs is still not very known. So the, you must advise them screening for fetal malformation at 14 to 16 weeks, do the maternal serum alpha protein anomaly scan at 16 to 20 weeks. And together, this test have almost 95% sensitivity to detect the open neural tube defect, which is one of the common one. 85% can detect cardiac defects. And if there is equivocal result, you may give amniocentesis. So as I said, teratogenicity is different. Like and you can here see that valproic acid has one of the highest, almost 8.9%, followed by phenobarb, topiramate, and then levetiracetam and lamotrigine are a little safer, and the carbamazepine. So also the monotherapy, which I've said the dose-wise, so if you have a few, if there is a juvenile myoclonic epilepsy, and it's the best drug is valproate, and she's not getting control with lamotrigine, as Rajesh said, or by levetiracetam, then you can use the low dose valproate that is less than 400 milligram, then the malformation rates are definitely lower. But if you go more than 1500, the malformation rate increases so much. Similarly, it is seen with lamotrigine, carbamazepine, and phenobarb. So try and maintain a lower dose, a minimum dose which is required to control uh, whenever you have these uh, drugs to be used in women. Other drugs like carbamazepine also has a uh, spina bifida risk and associated with cardiac defect. Levetiracetam has 1.6 to 2.4% uh, in three registry, 903 births are recorded till now. Lamotrigin is again 1.9 uh, to 2.6%. With phenytoin and valproate, you may have a fetal syndromes. Phenobarb is definitely has high cardiac defects in spina bifida. And uh, topiramate and phenytoin also associated with high rate of cleft palate. So after that, next comes, if there is so much teratogenicity and others, what about marriage and genetic counseling? It is advisable that to not, uh, in, in a study done by Santosh et al., it was found that 55% concealed and 45% disclosed the history of epilepsy. But the prevalence of divorce, separation, and disturbed marriages was significantly higher among those who concealed. So I think it is important that you advise them that you do not conceal, be open about it, and then think of having a marriage negotiation. And it is the neurologist can also play an important role. When then second comes whether my child will have, what will the offspring have? Now, this is only when there is a genetic epilepsy. If there is not genetic epilepsy due to some other reasons, there is no inheritance. So that you have to make clear. And for a genetic epilepsy, like absence and myoclonic definitely has seven to eight percent that patients, uh, the offspring may have. And focal epilepsies have less chances of being inherited. Then comes the fertility rate. Definitely fertility rates in women with epilepsy are low. Uh, it, and more than one third of the menstrual cycles in epilepsy are unovulatory, whereas in general, eight to 10% will have an anovulatory cycle. That is one of the major reasons. Other reasons are this, uh, the why anovulatory cycle? Because there is a hypothalamic inputs due to pituitary are disrupted and abnormal response of ovary to the pituitary hormones and the hormonal fluctuations also due to the drugs. So uh, potential factors other than this is the social factors. There are lower rates of marriage, late marriage, social isolation, decreased sexual activity and genetic factors and the anti-epileptic drugs together have decreased fertility and the Kerala registry, which is our, uh, one of the, the best registry in world uh, done by Sanjeev Thomas and his team 
showed that with one AD, the fertility rate is 31.8% per, uh, infertility rate. But if you have a three or more AD, the infertility rate goes as high as 60%. So it is important that when you are considering a woman to be on the anti-epileptic drugs, try and reduce it to the one or two drugs so that they, it doesn't have, uh, you know, it has a good side effect. Seizure frequency during pregnancy. In pregnancy, it is said that it may increase in 20 to 33%, decrease in 7 to 25%, and no change in 50 to 83%. And why? Because the effect has a many potential causes uh, on the drug levels also, because there are hormonal effects, compliance goes down because the mother feels, if I take this drug, my child will get affected, and then she tries to skip the medications. There are metabolic changes, uh, uh, there are fall, which causes reduce in the blood levels of anti-epileptic drugs, change in sleep patterns, tiredness, psycho psychological factors, constant worry, whether I will have a normal child or not, all this together may increase the seizure frequency. And during the delivery, almost 3.5% chances that you may have a seizure. So it is very important that these patients have to be managed along with neurologists and obstetric team together. Now, why there are changes in anti-epileptic drug goes down because there is a decreased absorption and there is increased metabolic, there is a weight gain which and there is a fluid uh, a retention. So there is a decreased protein binding and there is increased renal clearance and decreased GI mortality in the late uh, pregnancy due to the you know volume in the, of the child. So uh, the, some of the drugs like lamotrigine is particularly affected and the labels fall up almost by 40%. So if a woman is on lamotrigine, you have to have a preconception levels. And there are other drugs also like Oxca, Valproate, Levitrisum, they all have a significantly affected. So they, you have to monitor the level. So what is frequent blood level monitoring for the drugs, which is possible, like phenytoin, carbamazepine, uh, lamotrigine, levetiracetam, the drug levels is uh, easy and valproid and phenobab is easily available. So you should do that. And uh, American Academy of Neurology says it should be done every month, but probably in India, at least once in every tri trimester is important. But first is a preconception baseline. So before the child, uh, I mean, before she mother, a woman has become pregnant, do a level whenever she is planning a pregnancy so that you know that this is the baseline at, at which you have to maintain because she's well controlled on this. So whenever it drops, again, you have to increase the dose of the drug. So you have to advise this woman preconception that it is best to consult prior to pregnancy and have a planned pregnancy so that we can make the drug changes. Uh, we have almost three to six months should be there prior to that so that we can change to safer drugs. We can go down to the minimum drug. Sometimes if the seizures are very well controlled and two or three years you have not had any seizures, uh, EEG is normal, MRI is normal. You may also consider that of stopping the drug and then patient can go for conception. And um, you, uh, it is important that you counsel them the, that if you stop the anti-epileptic drug and if you have a generalized seizures, then it, it is likely that child might get affected. So the aim is to save, change to safe drug. You may also split the dose so that the high peak level doesn't reach because if the high peak levels are reached, uh, not reached, the chances of side effects are less. Currently safe are levetiracetam, lamotrigine, and carbamazepine. Supposing a patient woman is already pregnant and comes in first trimester, please do not change anti-epileptic drug because the, already the child is already exposed to that. Just do the serum levels and uh, start the patient on the... Uh, you know, folic acid, which I'll come later. Now, if there is a first seizure which has come during pregnancy and she's not a known, anti -ep known epilepsic woman, then if there is a first trimester, you may think whether there is a medications or a metabolic alterations are there or some toxicology screen needs to be done. But in second pregnancy, uh, second trimester, you may be uh, aware of, should be aware of a syncopal attack, which is quite common. And in the third trimester, you have to be very careful whether it is not a venous sinus thrombosis or press, and which is uh, more because there is a hypercoagulable stage during this. And anytime if there is infection or uh, mass lesions, you have to rule out. If there is a non-convulsive seizure, it doesn't affect so much to the outcome. But if there is a convulsive seizure, definitely increase risk of premature labor, fetal death during the seizure, 
and small for dead babies increases. And status epilepticus carries a significant maternal and fetal risk. So it is important to explain whenever the, the woman is having a generalized seizures that she should not stop her drugs. This uh, then during the pregnancy seizures uh, during delivery uh, have a cardiac effect on the this thing. So it is highest risk during the uh, risk in peripartum three days. You know the peripartum seizure risk as uh, it was. This was again in Kerala registry. So simple things like tell the mother that when you now that you are entering in third trimester, keep your bag ready and carry your anti-epileptic drugs to the. Uh, obstetric hospital because often it happens that in a hurry they forget the anti-epileptic drugs in 24 hours no ADs are given because the drugs are not easily available in ops nursing home and the patient forgets to take and then the, she throws a seizure. Also caesarean is not uh, required for all epilepsy patients. It should be as per the gynec or uh, as per the obstetric indication the caesarean should be done unless patient is throwing his grand mal seizures, you, uh, you have to consider a caesarean section. Otherwise, whatever is the like fetal distress or anything is there, whatever is in other women without epilepsy, same indications hold true. Then folic acid supplementation, as I've said, that it should recommend it of 0.5 to 5 milligram per day. And it should be started as soon as the uh, mother has got uh, married because accidental uh, pregnancies can occur anytime. And it is likely to reduce the chances of uh, neural tube defect. And also it, uh, it this study shows that IQ at six year with ASM uh, with folate, the darker lines are with folate, that IQ is definitely better compared to those without folate. So it is important that you put them on this. And during pregnancy, uh, continue that prenatal diagnosis you have to offer and the management of drug doses in the last trimester by uh, doing, because there is a maximum weight gain in the last trimester. So you must do the drug levels every month. As soon as they deliver, rapidly reduce the dose in the postpartum period because the more dose which is given, then it may go to the, in the breastfeeding to the uh, this thing. So postpartum, you may uh, have to, uh, you know, you may start tapering from day three in the postpartum. Now, uh, also some minor thing is avoid sleep deprivation. So they, she may have an assistant during to manage the baby at night because sleep deprivation will cause a kin epilepsy uh, in juvenile myoclonic and others add a top uh, feed milk at night if required also those who have a uh, myoclonic jerks avoid holding baby or use a sling and and they may uh, do not sleep with the baby on same bed because they may if they have a seizure they may roll over over the baby so such few things are very practical important things which you must tell to the mother now this important that breastfeeding is must because the very low levels of these drugs are, are going in the breastfeed and they, are, they do not cause any pharmacological effect. Now, the ethosuximide and lemotrigine are higher, but still they are safe. Only which we have to be careful is phenobarbital because it may have a clinically significant effect on the child and you may see a drowsiness. So whenever this drug is there, you have to be a little careful. But all rest, levetiracetam and all others, um, levetiracetam is expressed in almost 80 to 130 percent. But it is excreted via kidney and kidneys are very well developed in infants. So you do not have to worry. So breastfeed children again has a higher IQ. And the mean difference is also seen in like a four in the study. So it is important that you must encourage breastfeeding in spite of any anti-epileptic drugs. Just be careful when they are on a phenobarbital. The last few things are epilepsy and sexual dysfunction. Many women uh, may have a normal sex life, but definitely there is a reduced libido and arousal uh, reported most frequently. And this is sexual dysfunction is more seen in temporal lobe epilepsy. And 50% of women with right TLE and 30% with left TLE have been described. But the reasons for this could be multifactorial, psychological, social, cultural, and drug-related factors, as well as the neuroendocrine-related factors, which I've already uh, enumerated before. At menopause, fluctuations in ovarian steroid hormones may exacerbate or diminish the seizures as per the fluctuation, but HRT definitely may worsen the seizures. Menopause may improve the seizures most probably because the fluctuations in the hormones will go down. 
especially those who have a past history of catamenial pattern, for them, the menopause is definitely more beneficial. And the AD is bone health, definitely AEDs do cause osteoporosis, hypocalcemia, hypophosphatemia, especially drugs like phenobarb, carbamazepine, and phenytoin. Long-term valproate also has an effect on the bone metabolism and polytherapy also increases bone uh, metabolism adversely. So recommend the DEXA scan every five years, those who are on this. And there is also additional risk if this woman fall because of the seizures, it may cause trauma and it AD may induce attacks and dizziness because anti-epileptic drugs, the most common side effect is somnolence, attacks and dizziness. So recommended for a bone health is levetiracetam, lamotrigine, Topiramate. Now also the brevetiracetam, which has come a new drug, which is a next generation of levetiracetam, and it does not have a psychiatric side effect as levetiracetam. So that also can be added. And also you have to give calcium and vitamin D supplements as you are giving in other women also. Psychiatric comorbidities, definitely postpartum depression is occurred in almost 39% of women compared to 12% women without epilepsy. Postpartum blues affect 25 to 75% of mothers and because of the emotional changes and changes due to hormones. And also, uh, you know, the PNES is a psychological non-epileptic seizures are, is, is also seen in epilepsy patients with women with epilepsy. And definitely they have more seen in women compared to the male in the ratio of one is to three. So, the woman with epilepsy is, is uh, uh, you know, uh, it has a multi-pronged effect. It has a multiple side effects. So you have to be careful and you have to be uh, very vigilant in the type of drug you choose and the type of contraception you give and the uh, planning of pregnancy, marriage and all throughout together. So you have to handhold the woman together as along with the team of neurologists, epileptologists, neuroendocrine specialists, obstetric gynecology, and mental health professionals. And together, everyone achieves more. So we can have a good outcome and can carry other women to the normal marriage, normal birth, and can achieve everything in life. Thank you very much. Right. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Dr. Sangeeta and Dr. Rawat for uh, um, such an excellent overview covering almost all aspects. Uh, we are running a little behind time, but uh, uh, I believe we have, uh, uh, Dr. Surya, we have time for uh, a short discussion. And are there any questions? Um, uh, there is one question which is there in the chat box, but uh, can I ask the organizers if there are uh, um, any more? At the moment, this is the question which has come from uh, Atul Ramesh, and that's for Brajesh. Uh, would you start anti-epileptic with plus, first cluster of convulsion in benign infantile seizure disorder? Brajesh, you need to answer. Yeah, okay. So the, the question is uh, benign infantile seizures, not benign childhood seizures. So in benign infantile seizures, they usually come in a short cluster. They also occur, um, uh, you know, uh, infrequently compared to childhood epilepsy. But the most important thing in that is to make sure that there's nothing else causing it because then it's, it's very difficult to come to a conclusion. Once you've done, the baby is normal, the MRI is normal, the EEG is very often normal. In that situation, you can tell the patients that they are the mothers and fathers that if it's okay with them, they can wait for the second cluster to come. Because usually the cluster occurs over a day or two and that can be considered as the first seizure. Thank you. Gagan, you can take one more question for all speakers. Right. Uh, so, um, Sujit, can you... Um, I think one of the common uh, issues faced by physicians is, uh, uh, you know, one is to differentiate between acute symptomatic seizures and uh, uh, seizures which actually constitute uh, epilepsy, that is unprovoked seizures. So are there any clinical pointers which would suggest that, uh, um, or, or how do they go about, you know, differentiating between these two types of seizures and and what is the importance of differentiating them? 
Usually, acute symptomatic seizures does not require long-term treatment. Usually, they have a precipitating event uh, mm -hmm. like uh, hyponatremia, hypoglycemia. Then sometimes with the press, like uh, there is a eclampsia or there is a hypertension encephalopathy and they have a seizure. Mm -hmm. Then there is no need to start the antipleptic drug uh, for long term. You can give maximum for one week or if required, max one month. There is no role beyond one month. So we have to know about the precipitating event. And if there is a hyponatremia or sometimes uh, we know that uh, patient had a trauma and he had one episode of seizure, but imaging is normal, everything is normal, then there is no need to continue uh, for a long-term uh, treatment. If in addition, if there is, uh, you are doing EEG and uh, EEG is normal, then again, it uh, further tells that uh, uh, there is no need of antipleptic drugs and we should have long EEG, like we should have awake and sleep record, not only awake record. Because sometimes what happens, today only I saw a patient who had thought to have hypoglycemia. He had was a 92 year man and he had uh, uh, altered sensorium and there was persistent eye deviation to the right side. Mm -hmm. Relatives initially were not ready. They said that he's mostly due to hypoglycemia, he's a diabetic, but his sensorium doesn't improve. And then after three hours, CT was done and it showed there was a left frontal bleed. So we have to, uh, that is the reason for his altered sensorium and his eye deviation, and that is the reason for seizure. Here he will require a long term treatment. But he had a fall and just sodium there uh, or no fall and sodium was uh, low, 120 or 125, then he will not require long-term treatment. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, my next question is to Dr. Udani. Um, it's more of a general question, but uh, you can actually also tell us because uh, there are probably some differences between adults and children. So what happens, the patient comes to you and you uh, diagnose that this particular patient has epilepsy, and then you decide to start the patient on treatment. Once you've started the treatment, what are the chances that his, his or her seizures would be controlled? And, and uh, you know, in the short term and the long, long term. Okay, so one is that, uh... In a general sense, in most epilepsies, the risk of seizures, once you decide to start treatment, you're assuming the risk is more than 60% of recurrence. Once you start the treatment, on a general sense, the, in the sense, in generally, the risk is, is estimated to come down to 10% in the short term. The problem is that there are lots of variables. So, for example, if you have a you know, very high frequency of seizures, explosive onset of seizures, and you're getting daily seizures, you know, your chances of uh, control are going to be less. The younger you are, the more symptomatic, the etiology, the chances are less. So those kind of variables will be there. You'll have to counsel the family. But in general, say for example, the most of the run-of-the-mill routine garden type of epilepsies, you will be able to reduce the risk from 60 to 10% approximately. And the important thing is to tell them, because many people feel that now that you've started treatment, no more seizures should occur. And that has to be a counsel that it, you're reducing the risk of recurrence. But remember, you may get a seizure and you may have to increase the dose or do whatever has to be done so that they don't get confused. Right. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, the next question is to Dr. Sita Jayalakshmi. Uh, so cardiac disorders are extremely common. And uh, so in your experience, uh, Dr. Sita, how often would you have uh, uh, someone with an underlying cardiac disorder uh, and the patient is presenting to you with, with a presumed diagnosis or, or a referral diagnosis of epilepsy or, or seizures? And uh, are there any special considerations in terms of anti-seizure medications that you would uh, uh, keep in mind in patients who have an underlying cardiac disorder? Yeah, yeah. it's a very important question when we are managing the elderly with epilepsy. I will say 20% of the elderly when they were referred to us uh, as an episode of syncope or a seizure when they 
even from the cardiology when you evaluate you especially it's like i already discussed one should have an ecg lead you when doing an ecg mm. so definitely some rhythm disturbances can be picked up and after that doing a holter monitoring will definitely will reveal because these are intermittently occurring uh, arrhythmias mm. and second thing is um, means even following a asystole which is not so uncommon uh, in this population it means prolonged or an av block they can end up having a seizure like phenomena along with this and the person may not be able to give the history of palpitations so definitely it's a, we routinely do for especially it's a unexplained falls in elderly holter monitoring should be part of the protocol in the management and second thing is regarding the management definitely in elderly if there is associated cardiac disturbances we should avoid the sodium channel blockers i'll say all sodium channel blockers like phenytoin phenobarbitone sorry phenytoin carbamazepine oxcarbazepine and also lacosamide uh, these are supposed to have uh, some effect on the ca- means cardiac rhythm disturbances there are some reports of even prolonged qt interval with lacosamide but now the recent literature says that they are uh, relatively safe but we do have good number of other drugs like brevaracetam or even levetiracetam which are safe so i so definitely these are the good drugs to be used in elderly population even sodium valproate thank you thank you uh, so going on to dr rawat uh, you know it's uh, extremely common in physician practice is some uh, young lady is on anti seizure medications and uh, she d- discovers that she has preg- uh, she is pregnant and and in fact that is how it most often happens because most pregnancies they say are not planned and uh, uh, in indian marriages so what is your and and then the the question that often comes is is this drug teratogenic and if it is teratogenic then uh, you, you you need to go back to your neurologist to and ask them to change quote unquote change the anti seizure medications so just from a physician standpoint i mean someone who is seeing uh, uh, a young woman with epilepsy who has just recently become pregnant uh, what are the important points the physician needs to make note of and advise uh, what are the important points that the physician needs to tell the patient at that point yeah, yeah very important question actually i already covered that in my I question know, I, is that uh, but uh, it's important that we uh, reemphasize that that if the woman is already pregnant mm-hmm. and as she by the time she comes to know she'll be on a second month so do not change the anti epileptic drug at that time because if you try to change she is and if she is throwing a generalized seizures and if she throws a seizure in the first trimester it will be very detrimental to the fetus as well as so she may have a abortion also so do not try to change it yes but if she is very well controlled you may think of reducing the dose to if she is fit free for one or two years but prior to that you may think of reducing the dose and add a drug which is little safer but uh, do not stop whatever she is on so always tell them uh, that she, they will have to undergo uh, do their therapeutic drug monitoring they have to do blood markers for a fetal anomalies they have to do anomaly scan at 16 to 20 weeks uh, with a with a good sonographist you know not often the general obstetrician may not be uh, enough to uh, identify this uh, cardiac side effect and neural tube defect teratogenicity so they have to be a little more monitored and tell them that they have to uh, please often it happens that obstetrician also tells ye dawai band kar do nahi to aapke bacche ko kuch ho jayega so please please tell them that it is not correct always pay make a phone call to the obstetrician and tell them that this drug is important and it cannot be stopped and in spite of the drug the mother can have a normal child so it is important to emphasize that and if suppose anything happens uh, during the always tell them that please do a planned pregnancy next time and we get a six months prior to if they are planning then we can change over to a safer drug we can go to a minimum required dose and definitely it will be a better outcome yeah uh, thank you so much thank you for clarifying that uh, so uh, nirmal gandeep i have a 
I have a very simple question for you to answer to all the physicians. Because see, uh, the epilepsy is one way very simple to manage because they know about the drugs to be given. But can you guide when the physician should not hold on the patient and refer to a neurologist for epilepsy? Because many of them may be practicing in a rural area and for them to send a patient <laughs> to a major center or to a city may be difficult. But can you guide yeah. that, look, if this is the situation, don't waste time. I think this is the time that you send this patient for further investigation to a center. Uh, yeah, I think that's a very important question. And I'll request uh, um, all the panelists to put in some points where, you know, it, there can be a number of situations where it is important to take a specialist uh, opinion or a referral. And, and, and uh, in fact, I think the best way is that the specialist should give an opinion and, and the uh, primary care physician or the secondary care physician should then continue treating that patient. I, that is the ideal situation to my mind. So yeah, I think I first would... time them, the, you're very right. First time when they're diagnosed, it is important that their good labeling is done, type of seizure, type of syndrome and the etiology. And then right. the correct choice of drug, I think. Then the follow-up with physician is advisable. Yes, right, right. Okay, so that's one point. Uh, in your practice, Dr. Udani, what do you say? What do you think? I actually had a slide on this. Hmm. But basically, early referral is, see, most of the epilepsies can be easily managed by pr primary care, or, you know, physicians. And, and uh, like Sangeeta said, you know, in case there are some questions, you can even consult with a neurologist without really sending the patient, especially if you're from another city. But the point is that um, some, some situations in, in children are basically... Uh, conditions where you, uh, where you uh, situations where you expect trouble, and those are the very young children with epilepsy. The very frequent epilepsies, uh, the drug, the two drugs, three drugs have been tried. There's no change. Lesional epilepsies, you know, you, everybody does an MRI, but if you see something abnormal, you know, especially if it's focal and you, you know discrete, it's possible. It's definitely better to sort of take an opinion on that. And I'm not saying you go ahead and do surgery straight, but it's important to so those kinds of situations, you know, because the most important thing is, you know, nobody looks at development. Is the child speaking, is the child understanding? And these are very important, uh, you know, as when, when a baby, and this is, of course, pediatricians will be mainly handling this, but development should be asked for. And right. if there's any arrest or something, you know, must, must go ahead and any send the patient. Genetic yeah. issues? So in addition to the drug refractory epilepsies, uh, which are not controlled by one or two anti-she's or drugs, Definitely, the patient should be referred if there is associated psychiatric comorbidities like anxiety or depression. Or, uh, means these are definitely needs to be evaluated further. It can be part of the epilepsy or part of the syndrome. So it needs to be evaluated. And if they are getting frequent episodes of status epilepticus like thing where they get frequently admitted in the hospitals. Uh, so they should, means they also need a close evaluation. So there is uh, indeed some uh, debate yeah, and things you have. Can I just add one more thing? Yeah. Yes. Please. Yeah. Whenever there is a change in Caesar semiology in a known epileptic, that is also time when you should send to neurologist again, because this change in semiology could be that they are very well controlled and they have started throwing a pseudo Caesar because they are uh, losing on all the attention, uh, which they are used to. So, or there may be a, some different uh, which is happening. So, whenever there is a change in semiology, please do send to neurologist for at that time, just for an opinion right. again. Right. Right. Uh, so, uh, Dr. Sita spoke about psychiatric comorbidities and so the question is, and I'm directing this to Dr. Sujit, is uh, who should be treating these? How common are these psychiatric comorbidities and who should be treating these? these uh, psychiatric comorbidities are seen around 15 to 20% of the patients and predominantly these are the mood disorders and sometimes they are drug induced. So whenever, especially with the newer drugs like levetiracetam, we should ask them to follow up up to two weeks and four weeks because many times they make them like mad. The patient themselves come back and they said that this drug has made me mad or psychotic. So that is one drug which we should be aware that is most important for behavioral issues. Then there are uh, psychosis, which is different type. They can have ictal psychosis, they can have post-ictal psychosis. 
or a pre pill psychosis. And predominantly, this requires not much uh, significant antipsychotic drugs. So again, that can be well managed by the neurologist as compared to the psychiatrist. Because many times the patients are more, uh, must, uh, many times they add one or two more drugs and they get sedated and other uh, side effects. So that is one important aspect. And sometimes frontal lobe epilepsy itself is associated with severe behavioral uh, disturbances. So that is again um, uh, important role in a referral to neurologist. And we can have a simple rule of two and one, like a rule of two in adults, like when somebody is on two drugs for more than two years and having two or more seizures per month should be referred. Pediatric because it is a plastic brain, developing brain. So more than one seizure and one antipleptic drug not controlling it, you should refer them to a neurologist. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Sujit, for uh, clarifying that. Indeed, psychiatric comorbidities are extremely, extremely common. And uh, this is something that needs to be recognized. And uh, primary care uh, doctors who are competent to, who uh, should be treating epilepsy idly should also be competent enough to recognize these psychiatric comorbidities. And, and uh, therefore, this is something which is extremely important and should be uh, considered at every patient visit. So, uh, Dagan, one more situation I just wanted to, before we close, because, uh, you know, purple day and uh, epilepsy is important. So, I just wanted to, you know, I have seen a lot of patients in rural areas coming from physicians. The situation is a uh, patient uh, comes with first seizure, they start the drug, patient get another seizure, they add on second visit another drug, patient come back after some time, get another seizure and come, they add another third drug. And this is a very, very common situation that they just keep on adding one, one, one drug because uh, rather than escalating or finding out the type of seizure. So what would be advice to them when they should be thinking that polytherapy should be started or where they've gone wrong and that's where, how do, should they deal with that? Okay, so let's uh, get back to the experts with this question. Uh, monotherapy versus polytherapy. Dr. Rawat, please, what is your... Yeah, I think... Uh... The, first of all, if the first drug is not controlling, check whether you have chosen correct drug. Uh, you know, like in a myoclonic thing, if you have chosen carbamazepine or something. So do a little uh, more, more detailed okay. investigation, a prolonged EG, how Sujit had said, sleep, awake EG or four to six hours, which will tell you what type of uh, epilepsy it is. And then... Try and reach to the maximum tolerable dose of that drug. You know, just 100 BD, 200 BD may not be sufficient for that weight. So increase the dose till patient develops side effects or patient has a problem with, uh, you know, side effect due to that drug. After that, only if the seizures are still not controlled, you have to choose, think of another drug. Now, here also there are two situations. Supposing the first drug is not having any effect, then you may stop the first drug and add them another drug, a new drug. But if first you, uh, drug has got a good uh, control, but not a complete control, then you may continue the first drug and add another drug in a low dose. So that, that's how I think you have to go off for a polytherapy and not just go on increasing without going to a good dose, which is very important that you milligram per kilogram you have reached as per the weight of that patient. Right. Uh What's your uh, take on that, Dr. Udani? Uh, yeah, I generally agree with whatever Sangeeta is saying. I think the point is that, uh, you know, when patients come to us, it, it, one has to remember that this is to explain to the patient that this is not like having a cold and a cough and that kind of thing. There will be some time before it may get, you may require a drug, you may require escalation, et cetera, et cetera. And I think that counseling has to be done so the patient sticks to you. Most of the times the problem is that people want to start a new drug because you go to somebody else. That is, that I think, one of the things which sort of is the back of the mind, you know. And then you keep adding drugs and you, you know, you, the whole situation becomes worse. So counseling is important. Second thing is you must try and keep a diary. Because, diary. Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah, because, you know, when you say uh, response to drugs, 
It is not from, say, suppose you're getting two, three per month. It may not become zero. It may become one every alternate month. But that is a good effect. Hmm. And that has to be, you know, told to the patient. They can improve it. Now we will see a dose and see if it control ho Those kind of positive things should be given. Otherwise, what happens is that, you know, you add, add, add. And, then, and, then. and of course, then, I, in my opinion, I think if the first drug correctly chosen, correctly given and all that, there's absolutely no change in the seizures. You can try one more drug. But then, you know, you're try to now think that maybe I'm, I'm missing something out, maybe a mm. little opinion from a neurologist may be a useful thing. Mm. And Dr. Sita, uh, when a patient asks you, how long am I supposed to be taking this medicine? So what, what is your answer to that? Yeah, yeah. So adding to what uh, Rawat and Rudani has said, Actually, before, even in drug resistant epilepsies, we should uh, go for a video EG like Sangeeta said to rule out pseudo seizures and also to make sure that we are giving the right drug for the right syndrome, like juvenile myoclonic epilepsy, which needs uh, sodium valgrate as a drug of choice. Even levetiracetam may not help. It doesn't mean that they are not responding. And continuing with the question, how long to use the medication? Again, this depends on the what is the syndrome we are dealing with. There are some spontaneously remitting syndromes like benign Rolandic epilepsy, which we have seen the videos uh, so they don't need uh, actually reassurance by the parents is uh, of the parents is enough. But if they are anxious, we give them the treatment. Otherwise, the recommendations now, as per the guidelines, is two years of schizo freedom on uh, medication, and then if they are schizo free, we can down titrate or slowly. Uh, down titration can be done over a period of. Uh, uh, possibly one to two months based on the drug we are using. Usually benzodiazepines and phenobarbital need slow down titration and one can stop. But those who start with daily seizures, frequent seizures, if there is an imaging abnormality uh, and then those who had a status at the onset, all these will have possibly high risk of recurrence. Always do an EEG before reducing the medication. And if the EEG is active, the risk of recurrence is very high. We may still taper, but we inform the family means uh, there is good evidence to show that an active EEG just before reduction is associated with high risk of recurrence. Thank you. Can I add to that? Can I add to that? Yes, this yes, one yes. Thing? Certainly. Yeah. Certainly. See, the thing is, I, I think what is not being emphasized uh, by many physicians and neurologists as well is sleep is a very important, sleep deprivation is a very important trigger of epilepsy. And I think what happens is that when you're giving the medication, sometimes, you know, you can get away with a little sleep deprivation. When the medicine off, this has to be counseled that you must have your, uh, you know, whatever sleep you require adequately. Going to sleep late at one o'clock, two o'clock, getting up early, you know, all those things just ruin the whole problem. Lifestyle changes, I think. Fantastic. Some, yeah. some discipline in life is required for these patients. Absolutely. Yeah, so epilepsy can offer... Very, the, very important point being brought by uh, uh, Rajesh about the sleep, I think. The many of these patients, well controlled on the drug, get an attack when they are sleep deprived. Very important point. I think he has stressed upon very, very... Yeah, of, often you can give a small dose of, uh, you know, if supposing they have to go for a wedding or they have to travel overnight or something, added dose of a clobazam for those two, one yeah. or two days may be, you know, yeah. effective. So right. it is important to counsel them and tell them this, you know. Sometimes they just can't avoid the late night, then you should tell them that they can take an you know, additional sure. dose, especially those who have a history of sleep deprivation as a precipitating factor. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, we are a little over time and uh, uh, Nirmal, is it? Uh, yeah, now is the time to close. I just wanted to thank uh, all of you uh, for being here and uh, particularly Association of Physicians of India uh, to have the uh, joint meeting. We had about 1050 registration. Uh, this is the first time that uh, this program is also live on uh, IA and Facebook as well as on YouTube and there are hundreds of people uh, watching live so I must tell them uh, our next the fourth uh, session of the freedom series will be on 30th April and this will be on uh, Parkinson disease because April is the month of Parkinson's 11th April is Parkinson day so we, our next session will be a, on Parkinson disease and we'll come back to you with detailed program in next weeks or so. Thank you very much. Thank you, Gagan, for taking this uh, very, very 
pay forward with interesting questions and uh, asking the panelists and all the panelists, uh, including thank Chatabuj, you. who has to leave. Uh, thank you very much. Thanks yeah. to uh, Omnicure. Thank, thank you. Omnicure. Thank you, everyone. Good. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Everyone. And thank you for inviting those, us. Thank you. Those physicians who are in Mumbai, I'll request again to go and have a look at ceiling today, which might sure. not be purple tomorrow. So today <laughs> okay. is the last day to see. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Sujit. Thank you, sir.